Medical science now knows that between weeks 18 and 26, at some point during that stretch when a baby is in his mother's womb, when the testosterone starts to flow through the brain, there's a little bridge that connects the two halves of the brain. And for some reason, for male babies, there's sort of a separating that happens right in that little bridge. A lot of ladies right now, you've got light bulbs are just going off big time for you. You understand, okay, this makes a lot of sense. And, and it really is, I mean, there's not a complete separation between the two halves of the brain, but, but it really is true that men tend to operate out of one side of their brain. They could use both of them, but here's the thing. Whereas ladies, they just use both halves of their brains all the time. Uh, men, we have like two computers on our shoulders here, one on this side and one on this side. And one is a PC and one is a Mac. And they are not compatible. And so this explains a lot for why we behave the way we do. Generally speaking, women are better at multitasking than men are. I don't know why this is, but a lady can have dinner stirring and stuff's boiling over on the stove and she's got a little toddler on her hip and the phone rings and she'll just pick it up and keep going, right? But that's not how we men like things. We want it to get quiet so we can focus in with that laser-like zero focus. And that's how we, our best men, typically don't multitask well. It's as if men's brains were a collection of little boxes. We've got all kinds of little boxes nice and neatly organized in our head. And those little boxes, uh, they, they represent a lot of different things. Our, our, for instance, we've got a job box, and we've got a wife box, and a kid's box, and a money box, and we've got a mother-in-law box, and et cetera. And, and here's the basic rule. The boxes never touch. Okay, when you want to talk with a man about something, tell him what you want to talk about. He will go to that box, he'll take it off the shelf and open it up and talk about what's in the box and then he'll put it back and tidy and put it away. That's the way we operate. Um, there's a special box in a man's head that most women don't know about. This particular box has nothing into it, in, in it at all. It's referred to as the nothing box. And we men like to go to the nothing box as often as we can. <laughs> How many of you ladies have ever asked your husband, hey, what are you thinking right now? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> See, for ladies, that's impossible because ladies are always operating on some level intuitively. Something's going on. Don't tell me nothing. Nothing. <laughs> nothing in the noggin. <laughs> and you know what? The truth is, ladies, um, you know, don't be too hard on men because this is what helps us. When we get that laser-like focus, we zero in on one thing, and that's what helps us accomplish things. It, it actually helps us to be the protector for the family, that zero laser focus. That's just the way God designed us. But don't be upset if you don't get to go inside of a man's nothing box because men know that the problem is obvious. If he lets a woman into the nothing box, something would be in the box. <laughs> and then it wouldn't be a nothing box anymore. And the truth be known, ladies, if you were able to see inside the nothing box, you would be shocked and disappointed because you would find a vast wasteland, an empty space, an immeasurable black hole. <laughs> it's our nothing box. And maybe we have tapped into something important because the Bible bears out that God made the universe ex nihilo. It's a Latin phrase. It means out of nothing. Out of nothing, something. That's how God operates. I'm so excited about this brand new series of messages that we begin today. It leads us to and through Easter, Easter Sunday, next Sunday. The series is called Ex Nihilo, Out of Nothing, Something. And it means this, it means God created the universe out of nothing. 
I want to read scripture that I'll come back to later in the message. But Romans chapter 1 is the text this morning. Verses 18 down through 20. And in fact, eventually we'll read to verse 25. The reason like this, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. You know, there is a continual fascination with two things. The origin of the world and when will the world end? Where did it all come from? And when will it all wrap up? Just this past week, week uh, on Wednesday, I read an article from Drudge Report um, about the end of the world. Very fascinating article from a secular news source. It's pretty amazing. There's a phenomenon where the Sun, Earth, and Mars line up every 778 days. First off, I didn't realize that happens, but the, every 778 days, Sun, Earth, and Mars come into alignment. Now, that's not that rare. But what made this is, instance so rare is that it happened exactly seven days before the beginning of the Tetrad. Well, I didn't know what the Tetrad was. I had to research that. Well, the Tetrad is when the moon appears to be blood red. And not only just one instance of a blood red full moon, but in fact, four successive blood red full moons. That is referred to as the Tetrad. It's a phenomena of astronomy and it has been followed by scientists. It's pretty amazing that each time the Tetrad happens, something pretty amazing happens in history. For instance, in 1493, it coincided with the Spanish Inquisition, where Jewish people were driven out of Europe. In 1949, and technically 1948, the 18 months stretched over to 1949, well, in May of 1948, Israel became a state again after being wandering nomads for 2,000 years. In 1967 was the other time that it happened, and it's only happened three times in a period of 500 years. 1967, it just so happened that the Tetrad took place during the Six-Day War, in which Jewish armies were miraculously delivered from the, uh, all of the uh, Arab nations that surrounded Israel and attacked them. There were miracle accounts that took place during the Six Day War. So it's only happened three times in the past 500 years and each of those three times was something significant. So now, this past Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning, sun, earth, Mars lined up again. And this time they will be followed by four full moons that are blood red over the next 18 months. And it just so happens that the first full moon will be at Passover. And the next full moon will be in the fall when the Jews celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And then next year the third one will happen again at Passover. And then the fourth one will take place in the fall of 2015 when the Jews celebrate again the Feast of Tabernacles. 
So it's really amazing. Now, is it, is it true? You know, does that mean, uh, have we figured it out? Is it the end of the world? A lot of people are saying amazing things. In fact, John Hagee, a very respected pastor, author, and writer, and speaker, has said this is something really big that is taking place. But is it the end of the world? I don't know. You know, the Bible says no man knows the hour. Not even the Son, but only the Father in heaven. But people want to know, when is the world going to end? And the other biggie is this, people want to know, what about the origins of earth? Where did the earth come from? We are fascinated with those two discussions. In our culture, students are force-fed a steady diet of evolution. In this series, I want to expose the truth, and this is it, evolution is a belief system. It takes faith to believe in evolution. To believe in creation is more than just a viable option. It actually makes sense. And I want you to see that there is a special connection between the creation event and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. There is a, an intricate connection of Jesus' involvement in the creation with what would happen that we celebrate on Resurrection Day. Next Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead. You see, Jesus, the living Word, was the only one who could fulfill what creation demanded to take place. So the creation ties intrinsically to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The creation was ex nihilo. It was when God spoke something out of nothing. It, it's um, God just speaking. And there is. That's ex nihilo. Let me just say this to you. If your life situation seems hopeless this morning, if you feel like, you know, I find myself in a place where there's not a lot of hope on the horizon for me, and I just feel like, it's pretty hopeless right now, in fact. You need to know that Jesus is the one who speaks over nothingness and turns it into something. And you may say, I'm dead on the inside. There's just a, a black cavern. I have no feelings left. But God is able to speak existence into the core of you the same way that he spoke over the creation. So that's why we find purpose in Christ and share. Now they say, if you don't know where to start, just start at the beginning. So let's start at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, reads like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The earth was formless and empty. Listen to those words, how they're rendered in other translations of Scripture. Here's some other versions of Scripture. Void, unformed, barren, no form. There was nothing, formless, void, shapeless, chaotic mess. Soup of nothingness. Bottomless emptiness, empty waste, totally empty, idle and void, waste and void. That's how interpreters render these words from Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse number 2. Formless and empty, ex nihilo, out of nothing God spoke and made something. Now notice what happens in the, crea in the creation account. In Genesis chapter 1, what we have is God speaking. Just the same way that I'm standing in front of you and speaking right now. God spoke. And I want you to notice how many times in Genesis chapter 1 you have God speaking to create. You've got verse number 3, and God said, let there be light. Verse number 6, and God said, let there be a vault. Verse number 9, and God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered. Verse 11, and then God said, let the land produce vegetation. Verse 14, then God said, let there be lights in the vault. 
Verse 20, and God said, let the waters teem with living creatures. Verse 24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures. And it, it seems to me, in fact, that God speaks every other part of creation, but then when it comes to designing his prized possession, humanity, you and me, that there's a subtle shift in the wording. He stoops, he takes the dirt, he molds and he shapes. He makes man in his likeness. Different word, different wording. He makes humankind in his likeness. And yet, even in this making, it involves speaking because notice how it's worded in verse 26. Then God said, God said, let us make mankind in our likeness and in our image. And then when we finish out the, the verses here of, the, of Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Verse 29, then God said, I give you ever, every seed bearing plant. So he kind of goes back into that mode of speaking. What we have is that God is speaking and creating with his words. All that you see, all that you can touch, everything you taste or smell, all that you hear, every part of our world was spoken by the power of Almighty God. He created the universe. All of it was word crafted. It was word crafted. It was spoken into the existence by our God. God is speaking. The thing about speech is that there's so much potential to get it wrong for us humans. Um, yesterday, we were driving out of our subdivision and I noticed on the sidewalk a sandwich in a Ziploc bag, just as though it had fallen right out of a lunch pail, and there it sat on the sidewalk. And I said, I sure hope nobody um, lost their lunch out of that lunch bag and then it fell on the sidewalk. And Nick, who, Nick has the gift for sarcasm. If you don't know that about Nick, he has a real gift for sarcasm. And, and so I had said, I sure hope somebody didn't lose their lunch. And, and Nick says, so what you're saying is you do hope that somebody put a sandwich on the sidewalk on purpose? <laughs> I said, oh, wait, wait a minute. No, that's not what, let me rephrase that. Let, let me rephrase that. What I meant to say was, I feel sorry for someone if they're on their way to work and they lose their lunch. And Stephanie said, whenever I think of someone losing their lunch, that's not what I picture. <laughs> you see, there is so much potential to speak things the wrong way and to say it the wrong way and for it to be heard the wrong way. Language is hard. Speaking is hard. Uh, to try to get information out of this three and a half pounds of brains down to this tongue where it vibrates sound waves out into the atmosphere and somehow goes through the atmosphere and lands on your ear bones and they rattle in your inner ear so that you get the sound waves and then it travels through nerves into your three and a half pounds of brains. And you've got to figure out on that side what I meant on this side. Sometimes it gets lost in translation, right? I mean, how many of you have ever played that game gossip where you talk around the circle and it never ends up what it started as? It, it gets crazy and goofy. I refer to this as Adam's syntax. We, we struggle communicating. But... When God speaks, it's clear. I mean, I, I really, I wrestle with communication and it's, I make a living doing it and I wrestle with it. 
Communication is fraught with error. But when God speaks, it's clear. Now here's the difficulty that I have in preaching about the creation. I can't explain it. I want to be able to explain it. I can't. I'm a pastor. I, I want to explain things. I want to give direction and guidance. But I cannot explain the creation. There are things I don't know about the creation. None of us do. Here's the deal, though. Here's the deal. If I could explain the creation, then it doesn't require God to do it. And if, if I can explain it, and if I can figure it out, then I might just be able to master it, and I might be able to one-up that so-called creator. I could conquer, and I could be the ultimate good. I could be a God to myself. Did you know, many Christians are jumping on the evolution bandwagon, and they're saying things like this. You know, the Bible does not require a literal seven-day creation. Those days in Genesis chapter 1, they, they could have been epochs of time, periods of, of time. And so, you, you know, you would have to be pretty much a really simple person to, to be so literal about it and, and believe that God spoke the worlds into existence over a seven day period of time because what's really intended is for it to speak of epics of time. But that view runs into a dilemma. So, question. If the vegetables that were created on day three had to last for millions of years. How did they survive because the sun wasn't made until day four? See, the Hebrew word yom means day. It means a 24 hour period of time, a day. It means one day. That's the only way this word is translated. I don't understand it all, but I do think it's best to let the Bible speak for itself. And I will tell you, the Bible has been questioned by people throughout the centuries. And then the Bible always proves to be right. You can trust the Bible. It will stand the close scrutiny of all speculation because it is God's word to his people. Yeah, but what about 2 Peter, you know, where it says that with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is, is like a day. Doesn't change anything. In fact, the main teaching of 2 Peter is that you're not God. God is God. The main teacher te teaching of 2 Peter is that time makes no difference with him. He can leap across a thousand years as easily as one second or back and forth. So the point of that teaching is that God's patient with us. And he wants people to be saved. Like I said, uh, ex nihilo, the Latin phrase that means out of nothing. And ex nihilo implies two very important things. Number one, all things naturally are dependent upon God. All things are naturally dependent upon God. If anybody or anyone claims I don't depend on God, they're lying. All of us depend on Him for our very breath. The second thing is that the universe had a very definite beginning. It was out of nothing that instantly something happened. Now, Michael Bird, Michael Bird is a theologian that I enjoy reading. He says that creation and scripture work hand in hand beautifully. Now understand where he's coming from. He would agree with us to say the Bible is our authority for faith and practice. But he says it's amazing how nature and the Bible work hand in hand. One could picture almost like folded hands in prayer coming together perfectly. 
nature and the Bible almost as if they were bookends that hold everything in place. And so he says it this way, God speaks through the created order, the heavens, and in the law of the Lord, Scripture. God's revelation is a book in two volumes, nature and Scripture, the natural and the supernatural, the world and the Word. And they both speak of the verification of our God. There's three points I want you to take with you today. The first one is this, gaze at the invisible. Gaze at the invisible. The, the verse that I want you to read is verse number 20, and it says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and His divine nature have been clearly seen. Did you hear what he says? It's really an oxymoron. He says, the invisible things have been clearly seen. Now obviously, you can't see something that's invisible, not in a literal sense. But what Paul is saying is, you just step out tonight and stare into the heavens and think about it. And just try to explain any other way than God. This has been revealed to everyone. You can't stare and gaze into the heavens without realizing there was a God behind all of this. As you look at creation, faith begins to arise in your soul. This morning, early, early this morning, I left from the house to come down here. It was pitch black. And as I'm locking the front door, I gazed up into the heavens. The stars were beautiful. They were brilliant. Just the immensity and the enormity of God's creation. And it was a moment where I realized how small I am and how vast He is and how much He is in control of our lives. That Almighty God would take time to care about us and blown away by it. God's made it plain to us. So then, why do some people not believe? Well, that's a fair question. The Bible says it's because they suppress, catch this is important, they suppress the truth. You see that clearly in verse number 18, and that's our second point this morning. You've got to believe something. You've got to believe something. Verse 18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. What you have to realize is that you live your entire life in a culture that is engrossed with the idea of suppressing truth and not hurting anyone else's feelings and bringing all kinds of nonsense onto a level playing field. Suppressing truth. So, I believe this with all my heart and I believe the scripture bears it out. Every person is dealt a measure of faith. Said this way, every person on this earth has a God-shaped hole. Maybe they don't understand all that there is about the Bible and about Jesus and about uh, His death, burial, and resurrection. But every person gazes into the heavens and says inside their heart, there's got to be a God. There's just no way that all of this could be by chance. But what happens is, that they can't admit that because if they admit that yes there is a God then they're going to be accountable to God for their actions so humans we are good at inventing all kinds of clever ways of dancing around the in issue until we convince ourselves that we're correct but just sit next to someone who doesn't know God when they're dying Just enter into the room of people who have spent their whole lives saying, 
there's no God. I'm an atheist and I don't believe about your God. Listen to some of these. Thomas Paine was originally one of America's great patriots and he, um, at a point in his life, turned away from traditional Christian values. He wrote a book called The Age of Reason. He ridiculed the Christian religion. He slowly lost all of his friends. He ended up leaving America and died in England, a premature death. And on his deathbed, he said to a friend, quote, I would give worlds if I had them, if the age of reason had never been published. Oh Lord, help me. Christ, help me. You stay with me. It is hell to be left alone. David Hume was a popular atheist, famous for his empiricism, a real philosopher, skeptic of religion, and he cried loud on his deathbed, and here's what he said, I am in flames! I am in flames. And one person who is said to be a witness of his death says, quote, his desperation was a horrible scene. Anton LaVey was the author of the Satanic Bible and a high priest of a religion dedicated to the worship of Satan. His dying words were, quote, Oh my, oh my, what have I done? There is something very wrong. There is something very wrong. Voltaire, one of the most famous anti-Christian atheists, says on his deathbed, quote, I am abandoned by God and man. I will give you half of what I have, half of what I am worth, if you will give me six months of life. He said this to his doctor, Dr. Fochin. Dr. Fochin told him, there's nothing I can do. So then he was heard to say, then I shall die and go to hell. And his nurse said, for all the money in Europe, I wouldn't want to see another unbeliever die. All night long, he cried for forgiveness. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 says this, By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. What, what, listen to that again, what is seen was not made out of what was visible. In, in other words, God did not make the universe out of some prim, primordial stuff. He didn't have this soup of stuff, of matter, that was already there, and, and then he sort of slurried it together and boom, created the world. No, he spoke out of nothing. And here's why that's important. If there's anything before God, then there is no God. God is before everything. He is the first cause of everything. So, Michael Bird says this about people who decide to turn away from following God. He says the progression goes like this. Knowledge, ignorance, idolatry. Knowledge, ignorance, idolatry. He says, every person is born with something in them that says there's a God. They have knowledge of it. They just know it in their knower. It is intuitive. They understand. But then they want to do what they want to do, and they need a way to push God away. And so they creatively come up with clever inventions to say, well, I was wrong. There's not a God after all. Ignorance. And you can see embedded within that word ignorance is another word, ignore. If I ignore God and just pretend like he's not there and put him on the back shelf and I do what I want to do, then eventually, whereas I had been a person with knowledge, now I move into a state of ignorance. And ignorance just means I truly do not know. I don't know anymore. 
It moves from knowledge to ignorance to the last stage, which is idolatry. Idolatry is this. I've got to have something in place of God. I've got to believe something about how this world came into existence. And so I will create any number of idols to replace God. Do you know that Ray Comfort um, does a video in which he talks to biology and uh, zoology professors from Berkeley and USC and UCLA? And he asked them to show one evidence where one animal changed from one kind to another kind. And the professors, the ones teaching evolution in our highest educational system, in the highest, most respected schools, have to say, I cannot cite an instance of that. So he says to them, then what you're saying is, you believe that that's the case. And to the person, every one of them says, yes, that is my belief. To me, it just takes more belief. It I don't have enough faith to, to believe evolution. <laughs> I would tell you, it would, it, somebody has said it this way, for evolution to be true would be like a tornado blowing through a junkyard and producing a 747 as it came out the other side. <laughs> There's just way too many coincidences for this world to not have been put here by an orderly God. A God of design. So the, the last point then is this. Don't settle for a bad trade. Again in our text, if you look down to verse 25, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Ever. Amen. They exchanged the truth for a lie. They traded. That's a bad trade. To exchange truth for a lie. To exchange temporary for eternal. To exchange worship of something created rather than worship of the Creator. As we close this message, I have a question for you. What's the big idea? What's the big idea of this message? Here it is. Get the facts straight. If you've got doubts in your heart, be honest to God and go on a, a, a journey. Search. And you will see that God stands the test of time. And His Word is true. But don't just let somebody force feed you lies and just receive it without questioning it. Look to the Bible for your guidance and you will always be led down the right path. You owe it to yourself to make an informed decision. Gaze at the invisible. Decide what you believe. Don't settle. You have knowledge. Don't plead ignorance. No idols. I hope you are willing to bring a friend with you next Sunday on Easter. I want to tackle the creation. And this series is going to take us into discussion about how the world was made as a spoken act by God. God creates the world with a speech act. What you will see next time is that God becomes a man and that man has that man was the embodiment of the speech act. The Bible calls Jesus the living word. The gospel involves acting and speaking. The gospel becomes a speech act. The incarnation is a direct and unmediated communication of God. The resurrection fulfills the creation. The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. I always want to assume that when I'm speaking, there's a high likelihood there's individuals listening who may not be in a good, right relationship with Jesus Christ. As I'm preaching this morning, some of you might have realized, I don't think I'm in the right standing with God. I want to give you a chance before you leave today to know Jesus as your personal Savior. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, 
We just praise you for your blessings on our lives. Lord, you are so good. You are so faithful. Dear Lord, I just extend my hands over our congregation today and I, I pray that if anyone is here and they're not right with you, they would be right before they leave this place. Here's what I ask. Let that knowledge they were born with be stirred up within them. Just, let it, just stir it up, Holy Spirit. If some have been saying, well, I'm not sure if Jesus is everything He says He is. I, I don't know if, you know, if, if what I'm being taught from school, if that's correct, or, or is it in contradiction with what the Bible teaches? Here's what I know. If you will just come to God and say, God, I come as I am, just the mess that I am, just a, a, a bundle of uh, unanswered questions, and I present myself to you. If, if you will do that, He'll reach out to you. If, if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. The Bible says, if we draw nigh to Him, He draws nigh to us. So this is what we're doing. We're reaching out to Him. And we're expecting that He's going to. He's going to minister to our needs. If, if you need Jesus as your Savior, just pray this silently in your heart right now. I'm going to pray it out loud. You pray it silently, but you really mean this in your heart. You really, really mean this. And if you do, then God, He will save you. Just pray, Jesus, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Wash away all of my brokenness in this moment. I come to you because you created me. You, you spoke over me and, and you made me in my mother's womb. And like your word says, God, you know how many hairs are on my head. You know everything about me. You knit me together inside my mother's womb. So I just, I surrender. I surrender right now to you. And I, I ask you to become my Lord. More than just a historical figure. Jesus, rescue me. Jesus, save me. Be my mighty deliverer. Thank you, God. If you just prayed that prayer, here's what I'd like to ask of you. Everybody look up here for a moment. You, you were given a card when you came in today. I want you to just fold it. Take off the Connect card. Fill out that information and check that box that says, I gave my heart to Jesus today. Today I made a commitment to follow Jesus. I want you to take that card and, and out in the lobby, that black uh, desk, we call it the hub, just place it right up on top of the hub and that way we can connect with you because there are some very important steps that you need to take right out the chute here in your new journey. Also, let me just say this, if you are, um, you know, if you're not new here and you come every week and you always get the card, this is for you too. Maybe God's doing a work in your heart and life and there's a place on here that says prayer requests and celebration card. If you want to know, um, if you want us to know something that you praise the Lord for, a testimony, we'll put it on there. That will encourage our prayer teams. If you would like a prayer request to be prayed over throughout the coming week, put it down and we'll make sure it gets to our prayer teams. Um, so, I'm saying that it's not only the ones who are getting saved who are putting their card on the black desk out there. It's, it's lots of different people doing that every week. But if you just ask Jesus into your heart, please, please, you need to do that so that we can make sure you get pointed in a good direction. Also, out at the Hub, there's a, there's a newsletter. It's, it's actually called the Hub News, and it's, uh, it has a calendar on one side and it has a lot of information on, about the church. And I hope that every one of you will get in the habit of taking that every month when it comes out and stay up to speed on everything that's happening in the church. And then one more thing I want to share with you. If you do not get our weekly email newsletter, 
one of two things. If if you signed up for it but you don't get it, it means that it's going in your spam. You have to check and make sure it gets in your inbox. But it goes out once a week. But the second thing, if you've never signed up for it, go to BuckeyeFirstAssembly.net and then just scroll down on the left hand side you see the word about us and as you go over you'll see a place where you can sign up for the e-newsletter it's called bfa reflect if you haven't done that do it today here's why this week i'm going to send out every day an email usually it goes out once a week but this week it's going to go out each day and each day i'm going to give you your share package it will be tips and tools on how to lead up to bringing a guest with you next Sunday morning for Easter Sunday. How many of you know people will go to church at Easter, they wouldn't go any other time? You got friends and neighbors and, and some of us, we, we joke around and say, oh, they're just coming because it's Easter. Or it's just Christmas time, that's when they come. We don't care. I even heard one person say, you know, we call people CEOs. We got a lot of CEOs at our church. Well, what's a CEO? Well, that means Christmas and Easter only. <laughs> I don't care if they are CEOs. Get them here. Because next Sunday, we're going to invite people to begin a journey. And we're going to invite them how to start walking with Jesus and go through training classes and how they can truly grow with the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior headed into the summer months. So it's going to be a great, great day next week. Invite somebody to come with you for church. Don't forget BuckeyeFirstAssembly.net. Sign up for that e-newsletter and make sure you're getting it each day this week. Let's all stand to our feet. I want to ask Barbara.